Hello and welcome back to Web Components Remote Conference. I'm still Justin. And with me is our first speaker of the day, Bed Overend. He's going to talk about components for content. So I'm not going to get it the way. Be take it away. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Justin. Um, so yes, I'm, uh, uh, my name's uh, Bed Overend. I'm um, a developer from Melbourne um, in Australia. Um, first of all, just thanks for having me. It's pretty exciting to be talking about web components. Um, it's a fantastic technology, and I can't wait to explore it some more. So, uh, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, components for content. Um, so, firstly, I'm uh, I'm one of the founders of a company called Simpler, um, and Simpler is a startup that's. Uh, working to build a sort of an alternative content management system. Um, we're heavily involved with web components, um, and so a lot of this talk is going to be a bit about uh, sort of how we how we see content management, um, sort of the difficulties we think um, exist there currently, and uh, and and how we're using web components to um, sort of bring the new era of um, of content management. Around. Um, so, if you're interested in the talk afterwards, um, please go and check us out, um, or just ping me and have a chat. Love to. So, CMSs they inspire rapture and incite table uh, incite table flipping. Um, I just wanted to start with this because I feel like it's a uh, great <laughs> great quote about CMSs. Um, I feel like. No, not really anyone that I've spoken to, and they're like, oh, yeah, love my, love my CMS. And then we get frustrated with it. It's perfect. And it is the uh, table flipping. No doubt that when a CMS is working well, it's, uh, it's, it's a brilliant thing. So why is this? Um, and I want to go through sort of what we've sort of, uh, how we've, how we've uh, built up the CMS, how it's come to be. And I think that's to do with um, how we've sort of built web pages over time and sort of built a CMS to account for that. So back in the day when we were doing sort of handcrafted HTML websites were literally just collections of documents. Um, so all we would have to do is type out that static HTML, um, put it into folders, um, and that was our website. Then we sort of realized that you know as these got bigger, it wasn't it was pretty clumsy, and we needed a better way of doing this. So we would pull in sort of HTML from databases or just content from databases, and our websites then became more complex. And what they would do would string together sort of HTML code and databases to become the first idea of a dynamic website. Um, and this is great, but you know we needed a better way to change the content in that database. Um, we needed a GUI for non-technical. Um, so they didn't have to, you know, dig around in a database and update the content manually. And this comes into sort of publishing, which I think is, you know, moving on from that initial dynamic sort of um, web stage. We're still in that web 1.0 era where um, where websites are all about being consumed and there's no interactivity. And generally, to publish content on there, it's just a big swathe of HTML. Um, there's no fine-grained control there. And I wanted to mention that because that really influences how we deal with CMSs today. Um, CMSs have been built on this idea that uh, we publish large chunks of content. Um, and that also plays into how WYSIWYG editors came about. Uh, we needed a way for these um, big you know, chunks of HTML to be displayed on the page and to be edited easily um, by our content editors. And so WYSIWYG seemed like a great way to go, uh, except <laughs> As you know, the uh, general flaw with WYSIWYG editors is, is uh, what you see is not usually what you get. Um, so what you usually get is it looks like a database vomited, vomited all over your page. Um, and that's kind of um, set up sort of the structures for, the, for the, the, the foundation of, I guess, CMSs that uh, we see over the last few years. Basically, the CMS ends up looking like it has these problems or these features. Basically, it has a monolithic structure, which means that the CMS overall is, uh, is, is, is much like a monolithic app. So everything from editing the, uh, connecting to the database to editing the content to um, then rendering that content in you know, templating or 
um, routing of that um, using page, page slugs and predefined URLs and everything, that's all done within the one content management system. Um, and that means it's pretty hard to edit any individual piece. Um, in fact, if you want to edit any individual piece, you either have to hack into the CMS or you know, basically just get a new one. The second point is that monolithic content. So it's, again, this idea of content being stored in large blobs, um, just these big sort of black box of information, which is, is almost impossible for a developer. If you're, if you're trying to, um, to pull that content apart and, and you know, build semantic sort of side out of it or, or to use smaller parts of a larger chunk um, of data, it's, it's really hard to do. It's, it's pretty much impossible. And the final point on these is that it gives author a bad author UX. What I mean by an author UX is the experience that a content editor goes through when they log into a CMS and they create new content or edit existing content. If the content is in large sort of free form um, forms, it means that the author is, uh, A, they have complete flexibility, but it also means they don't have security. Uh, which means they're going to be unsure about what they type if it's going to come out on the other end is exactly what they want. Also, because they are separated by a form and not some kind of inline editing, um, it means they, again, have to be checking back and forth um, what that content looks like when it's displayed and viewed and what they're typing it as and how they're editing it and even where they're editing it. So what we want instead of these is modular versions and a better author UX. And by modular, again, I mean that you know, you can take different parts out of the CMS and use them individually. Um, with content, you can use individual pieces of content without, uh, without needing the entire chunk. You can build up large chunks together, um, but each is an individual piece, so it can be distributed across different platforms. You can show different pieces of content based on the um, response, based on the uh, screen size of the device or the network connectivity of the device. All of these things are needed in the modern web and the way we build websites today. Um, and that's why we need content management systems to um, be prepared and ready for that. And finally, we need a way for authors to feel more comfortable in what they're editing. So that means that the, the way they edit, um, edit content needs to be secure and stable. Um, and yet they also need to be able to get instant feedback on um, the content they're changing. Um, so that means probably something like in-place editing, um, though it shouldn't be conflated with WYSIWYG, where WYSIWYG is essentially you can do whatever you want. Um, instead, in places where you can edit things but under very constrained, uh, I guess, rules, um, but get that instant feedback. So I just want to take a moment to talk about headless CMSs. Uh, I feel like what I've been talking about here, some people might have gone, well, hey, headless CMS have been pretty big over the last couple of years. Um, they're, you know, a massive part of the web now. And, and that's true. Um, basically, headless CMSs, if you don't know, um, they take out the presentation layer from a CMS. Uh, so you've got, um, with the monolithic one, you might have that presentation layer which controls the templating and everything like that. Uh, take WordPress, for example. If you take out the templating and the loop and, and um, all the structure of building out the HTML and instead replaced it with an API, um, then it opens up a whole heap of flexibility to the developer. That means that they can build their site using um, any kind of front-end framework. They can um, make a single page app or they could uh, generate it using a completely different back-end framework or language or anything. Um, it means it's a lot more powerful. But while that's great, it's not quite there. You still need, uh, it still has that back-end of authorship and that difficulty when it comes to editing the content and changing that. So what we actually want to have is a tool, not a framework. We want content management to be something that we can sort of, you know, slide into our tool belt and we can use alongside all of our other favorite tools. We don't want it to be this thing that restricts what we can do and, you know, puts us in a sort of box where we can only choose what works with it. We want it to work with our, our needs and, and our current tool set. We also want that granular content control. So we want editors to be able to um, edit in small chunks. So we as developers can then use that in different reuse, same piece of content throughout the site. Um, if we need to restructure the site, it's not going to be major headaches because you know the initial setup was just for large dumps of content um, based on this structure. 
um, it means that we can pull out and distribute it onto different platforms even. And lastly, we want a unified editing and viewing UI. So we want a UI where um, a content editor come and can see the content where it is and then edit it in place and they'll get that instant feedback. Um, but we also want that, that them to feel secure in what they're editing so they're not going to break anything. So the simpler, um, the kind of the solution that we've attacked and the, and the one that we've come about is using a library of dynamic elements. So what do I mean by a dynamic element? So essentially a dynamic element um, is essentially a custom element that works like its HTML element counterpart, except that it does a few more things. First of all, it will get and set data to a RESTful API. It will deserialize that information from the API and set it to its own internal properties. Um, so for something like text, it might get from the uh, API a text string, and then it will set that to its inner HTML property. Um, and lastly, it will have viewing and editing states. So when the element is initially loaded, it will be in a viewing state so that a consumer of the website or web app or whatever it is, if they're looking at the site, they don't see any different. It's just like static HTML. Um, but then those elements can be moved into editing states where they can where they can show up editing controls, which will change the properties on that element and therefore change how it visually looks. So for something like a text element, that'll mean a cursor will pop up. Um, you'll be able to type in information. You'll be able to change the, uh, um, you know, you might be able to make things bold depending on how much control. Um, that's completely up to the element author. Then you'll be able to serialize those properties back into a JSON object and then save that back to the API when the content editor is finished making those changes. So then what you'll end up with is an element that is dynamic and can persist its data back to an API. What we've done here compared to the traditional CMS is we've taken away the presentation layer like the headless CMS, um, but we've also changed the editing layer and added in custom elements. So now we've got an API um, which stores all the information and presents it in a sort of RESTful interface. Um, and you also have custom elements, which then consume that data when they're loaded into the page, and then also are able to edit that data and persist it back against that API. So you now don't have that dashboard or admin UI necessarily. You instead have a collection of elements that will all deal with their own content talking to the API. So what's that look like? So I'm going to step through uh, sort of just a just a, a, a little image element like this scaled image and I'm going to show you how that would look as a dynamic image. Um, so a scaled image um, basically it's just a custom element that I've created. Um, it's intended to essentially mimic a normal image. Um, it's got four properties on it that I've shown here with attributes. So the source, the source property is very much like um, the image um, a normal HTML images source, same deal, just point it to URL, it'll load the image and display it. Uh, the scale, offset X and offset Y. So the scale will uh, just change how much it's zoomed in or zoomed out. The offset X and offset Y will obviously um, pan that image around so it can show in a different spot. So this custom element in and of itself is pretty nice. Um, you know, it's, it's not that exciting, um, but you know, you can take a URL image and then change the scale and change the offset and change, um, and change how, it, how it looks. So it's a bit better than our traditional, just standard HTML image. But now what we want to do is we want to add the ability to change those properties um, in place. So an interface that comes along with that image, uh, with that custom element to change those properties. So for example, if we've got, um, we could add an editable attribute. Um, and basically when that editable attribute is added, um, you can see here it's got an attribute change callback, which will just show the controls. Um, I've just used arbitrary stacks here, but basically what we're doing is in the shadow DOM, we're showing these controllers that pop out only when that editable is active. And then you can change, so you could change that scale property, you could change that offset property, um, you could even upload an image and perhaps make it a base 64 image um, so that it could be um, uh, displayed in the browser, the, that new image that you want. 
So this is cool. So we've got now an editable image that can sort of be scaled and zoomed in or out. Um, and that's quite nice, except without actually having an API to talk to, um, it doesn't do a lot. I mean, we could, we could I guess, pull out or pull the information out of it, do something with it. But what we really want is to make, uh, connect this to an API like this. So this here is just uh, an arbitrary example of a REST API. Basically, you've got a um, uh, content, and then you've got the uh, ID of that content, maybe hero image. So when we get that, we get this JSON data back. Um, it has uh, those four properties that we talked about, source, scale, offset X, and offset Y. And, uh, and, and then in the next one, we can look at how to actually load that in. So we can add functions to our element, which will automatically take perhaps an attribute, see here your remote ID, um, and fetch that remote ID from the server. So all this low function is doing is it's just yeah, sending that request over and fetching that JSON data that we saw, so this JSON data here, and then it's feeding it into a deserialized method, which I'll, I'll show you what that does later. It then has the uh, offset function to essentially save its own, its own state and put that to the API. So what this is doing is it takes the, um, again, that remote ID attribute, so that's how it you know, uniquely identifies it across the site, and then it will send that over to the server and uh, with, itself, um, with its own property serialized into a JSON object. So this is just the deserialize and serialize methods. I just wanted to show you here sort of for code completion. Um, plus, I also wanted to basically just show um, how simple it is for something like this. Um, basically, yeah, all you're taking is a JSON object. I'm using lovely ES6 um, destructuring and automatic structuring. But essentially, all we're doing is taking those JSON properties and setting them to our own property. But this could become more complicated. So, for example, if you were doing something with a markdown element, um, it would, uh, you might save markdown data to the server, except when you deserialize it, you would actually want to change that HTML, uh, change that markdown into HTML, and then set it to your own inner HTML value. So basically, this is the flow we now have. So we've got this load function, which will pull that information in from the API and then set it to, the, uh, to that image value. Then the image might become editable and you can change the property values and then you can save that, which will serialize it and send it back to the API. And these functions can be called at various points. Um, the load function would most likely be called, um, the load function would most likely be called on a connected callback, so when it's attached into the DOM and the save would probably be hooked into uh, maybe another event if you want to save them all at once or something. So what we now have is a dynamic image. So we moved from originally having this uh, scaled image, which is just you know a nice custom element, um, not a huge difference from the original image. Um, and then we've added this, essentially the ability to edit those properties using a UI um, that can be toggled on and off. And then we also added in this unique ID property, which can then be used to send to the uh, to the API to get and set that data automatically. So that by itself is pretty nice. Um, it's, it's just a singular, you now have an element that can deal with its own data. It can persist away um, into a database and it can handle updating itself all in one single package, which is really nice. Uh, but obviously you wouldn't use that by yourself, uh, by itself. Uh, you would want to use sort of alongside an image, you would want to use sort of dynamic text elements dynamic data elements, articles, list, icon, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, what you can do is you can create all of these dynamic versions of them and then use them all together. And the great thing about custom elements is because they're uh, so modular um, and work within themselves is that you don't need to worry about how they're gonna interact between each other. As long as they all do their jobs correctly, then you'll be fine. Um, and it also means that uh, because you're dealing with custom elements. You can send this you know, to anyone and it will work. It's in, completely interoperable. So anywhere these elements exist on a web page, they will do the same thing, um, regardless of that environment now. So what does this look like once you actually put it together? So this is just some demo code of simpler elements um, that work 
pretty much the same way. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot more going into it um, to tidy it up and, and make the UI work and, and make it talk properly. But basically, if I play this, you'll see that on the right-hand side, I'm editing these elements, uh, uploading a new image, and then setting the scale and panning around. So that's the exact image that I talked through before. And so basically that editing interface is exactly what is on the left-hand side of the screen here. All it is is the HTML custom elements declared. Um, they've been given IDs so that they know where to look in the API. And um, they've come together to perform this interface. And then on the right-hand side, as you can see now, that's how it would look when it was in view mode. Um, but as before, that's how you would edit it. It's also worth noting, obviously, this is just currently sort of um, separated elements um, working on their own, but you would probably need some way to obviously connect them all together. So that would mean, uh, you know, you might have um, some state management which toggles editable on all of them at once, and that might happen when the user enters in a particular URL, like um, edit, um, or it might automatically happen when the user logs in. Again, maybe it's a button that they click to log in or to change the URL. Um, but the foundation of these elements being dynamic is what you need at the core to build up the CMS. The JavaScript that you can layer on top or the other elements to manage the overall state, you know, perhaps a save all button which goes through all the elements and saves them, can be added on, um, on top of those quite easily. So let's look at what we've got now. So we now have a modular structure. So each element, um, can be used at will by the developer. Um, there's no restrictions. Um, thanks to the fact that they're custom elements, it means they're completely interoperable with whatever system. So that developer can use whatever backend system they want. It means they can use whatever um, front end sort of framework that you're working with. Um, you can distribute it to all of those environments and it will work fine. It'll, you also have modular content. So because each element is dealing with its own individual piece um, it means that you can be as fine-grained as you want just purely based on um, how fine-grained those elements are. So my examples of text and image, those are obviously like very, very, very fine-grained. Um, those are about as small as you're going to get. But then you could expand and make like articles or, um, as I said before, markdown ones, which are more complicated um, for, for different scenarios. Uh, but the great thing is you can keep it really modular and really easily so. And lastly, you've got that unified UI. So you've got these elements which you know you can edit in line, but it's not a WYSIWYG. You can only edit them in very constrained, uh, I guess, rules. And those uh, and the author isn't going to be worried about breaking that uh, because it's constrained to that specific piece of content. And it also means that the editor is able to get that instant feedback of what the content looks like in the viewing um, as they're editing it. So this is just sort of how we've looked at using custom elements and how we've looked at you know, bringing a new kind of content management. This idea of um, collections of custom elements all being used together to form a CMS. Um, but, this, but this sort of fundamental um, idea of using dynamic custom elements. But in the future, um, it needs to be a lot bigger if it's going to work. Um, it needs to be sort of an ecosystem of elements. And I guess that's you know the, the buzzword of any sort of new technology is ecosystem. But it is really important. If we've got an, you know, an ecosystem like, like, uh, like, for example, WordPress's plugin architecture, but with custom elements, it's fantastic. It's using the platform and it's, it's open source. Anybody can see them and edit them. And we can have this, uh, and you know, if you come to finding a new piece of content that you need to make an element for, someone's probably already made it. And that's a really exciting part about custom elements. We also want to have a, just a general idea of custom elements being able to be serialized into JSON and also deserialized. Um, which moves on to the next point is that if you've got that standard interface, you could then build in a way for um, elements to use arbitrary API endpoints. You know, they don't even have to talk to a backend, they could just talk to um, local storage, for example, um, if you just wanted a local app, or they could talk to um, and perhaps a service as a read-only uh, API. Um, but essentially, you could make these elements that can have their API endpoints swapped out um, uh, for the different API that they're talking to um, or transformed on their way. 
and also the ability to have editing templates. So that Shadow DOM where the editing UI comes out, that's just one version. Um, but there's no reason why an element couldn't have um, multiple different templates um, or you could provide a template to that element um, for its editing UI or in general just style the editing UI throughout all of it to be customised to your particular CMS um, or that particular element that you're working with. So takeaway from all of this is I think these custom elements I see as a huge part of content management moving further, moving forward uh, with this ability to have all these elements connected together and operating against APIs, this inline interface that doesn't break, that actually works. Um, I can see it as being a foundation for new content. We can build new CMSs from it. We can build really complex ones or really simple ones or just use it for, use the elements by themselves um, for editing. Um, but I think that's the beauty of custom elements and, and where they can head um, and where they can take us. So thanks. So many buttons. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. And we're going to kill the secondary screen. Boom. See, we know what we're doing here at Web Thank you. Remote Conf. Thank <laughs> you, Ben, so much. We got a little time. So we've got a few questions down here in the chat. Uh, if you want to take some questions, we got a little, got a few minutes here. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, simple elements are built using ES6. Uh, what advantages did ES6 bring to the Simpla team? Um, ES6, I think. Uh, well, I think a big part of it is um, the way that you think about um, custom elements. Uh, particularly, I know initially the class syntax, for example, um, while there's been sort of a bit of debate around whether class syntax is good, I think the V1 spec has really helped with that. Basically, um, it allows us to think about um, custom elements as objects in that classic OOP style, um, which I think is very nice. Also, I think ES6, a lot of language features has just made it a lot easier uh, to work with. Um, I think uh, things like destructuring and structuring, I mean, all of those things um, play a huge part. Um, and then, yeah, I, th I, think, I think that the biggest thing has probably been the class syntax and helping get our, get our heads around um, how those elements work. Um, and also, I mean, we, we haven't actually started implementing them yet, um, but the the way that you can extend classes, again, I mean, I know you can all do this in vanilla JavaScript, but um, if, you, if you haven't looked it up, have a look at Justin Vanyardi's um, mix with library. Um, basically, it's a way to define behaviors and mix-ins for class syntax, um, and that's what they're using in Polymer 2, I believe, and uh, that's, that's really exciting. Um, and a lot of that comes from, it's, it's really easy to do with uh, ES6 Sugar, um, and that basically will be able to have sort of different element behaviors that you can just mix and match, take what you need and make really lightweight components with just what they need. So that, that's really exciting. And then another question we've got from the audience is, is in the case of dynamic sort of components, would you have to create CRUD API for each one of those? Like how would that sort of work? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the last bit? Uh, that was just a bit of sure. stuttering there. So what does it mean? Does this mean that you would need to create CRUD API endpoints for each of your dynamic elements? So the way that we've done our particular elements, um, basically um, we've created an arbitrary uh, content endpoint. Um, so what that means is we've just got uh, an unstructured NoSQL essentially um, uh, key value pairs. So um, that content endpoint I gave in the slides, um, basically you just have um, the key, which is the unique ID, um, and then you save that JSON there, and that's about as much structure as you give it. We give a bit, we give it a bit more extra structure, but we keep it free form so that the elements can do whatever they want. So that means you've got one CRUD API um, for all of your data. Um, but it doesn't mean you have individual CRUD APIs for each different type of element. Um, we've kept it sort of quite flexible um, so that, you know, yeah, exactly, you're not having to create new ones each time or new schemas or new endpoints for each one. If that answers well, the question. I, I think it does. And if you have other questions, uh, be sure to catch, uh, catch them in the chat or ask additional questions uh, in the Q&A. 
Q&A. We'll, we'll try to answer them as they come in. We can actually answer them via mystical keyboards as well. Uh, but we want to thank you again for coming on to the conference and giving a wonderful talk. Thank you again so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, my pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you guys so much for uh, setting it all up and organizing it. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Um, it was a pleasure to talk. Thanks, so everyone. this session will be available almost immediately after I hit the stop broadcast button. Uh, we're going to get ready for the next session, which starts in just about five minutes with our next speaker. So we'll see you in a second.